All right, here we are. Welcome to the Caduzzi Cast with Sue Costello. And I am sitting here with Eric Weinstein, who I call the real E. Because he is the real E, and everybody makes fun of me, but he has been Mark's, Mark Wahlberg's, how would you describe yourself? Road manager, assistant, uh, production coordinator, pick a letter from A to Z. You have been everything. You have been his right-hand man for... 20 years. 20 years. Mark Wahlberg's right-hand man, 20 years, the real E, the guy on, uh, what, Kevin, what's his name? Kevin what? Conley. Kevin Conley on, on Entourage Antoine. is based on you. All right. Loosely based on me. You know, he's got, he, I don't have the same problems he has with women, you know? The attitude that he possesses with the business, that's me. You know, being tough, being a hard ass, not accepting of bullshit, you know, that's me. The problems he has with women, I don't have those problems. You're cooler than him. I'm much, much, much more cooler than he <laughs> is, you know. All right, so bring us back. I want to know from the very beginning. So you were born where? I was born in Manhattan at a, a place called Jewish Memorial Hospital on 192nd Street and Broadway, which now is, I think, a parking lot or it might have been turned into a school. They burned it down or something like that a while ago. And I was raised in the Bronx on 234th Street. Which was only like a, you know, it was close. It was a 10 minute cab drive for my mother to get to the hospital. So she, that's why they were, I think I was born at Jewish Memorial. It was right across the bridge, right across the water, you know, and you were right there. Raised in the Bronx, went to school in the Bronx, went to D. Wick Clinton uh, High School for about a New York minute, 38 seconds. Uh, walked in there in September, dropped out in November. They told me anyone who wanted to take this test, you didn't have to go to school anymore. And I was like, okay, give me the test. I'm not going to school. I hate school. So you took, you got your GED? You went to school from September to November and then dropped down and got your GED? No, wait a minute. I want to go back. Were there any complications with the birth? No, I was just a crazy, you know, kid, you know, lots of drugs, you know, and I, school, I did not, and I didn't want to be in a school. Dewey Clinton, there was 6,000 boys in Dewey Clinton, no girls, no women. So is that what motivated you to say? Get the kid? fuck out of that Come place. On. So you got your GED. Get me the fuck out of my GED, and I was like, see you later, motherfucker. Kiss my ass. All right, so you're 13 years old at this point? No, I'm uh, 14 or 15. 15, I think. And how did your mother take that you were just... Oh, she wasn't too happy because I forged your name on the paper that you had to get your mother's permission. And I didn't, you know, I forged it, you know? And the next thing she knows, you just went she, to school anymore? She didn't know I was in school, and I was able to... I'm going to school, see you later. What about, oh, you faked it, you faked yeah. it, you were in school. Right. What about siblings? Did you have any siblings? My brother, and he was, you know, he, my brother was older, he was already, you know, he was there in the same school, and he was graduating there, so it was all the attention was on him, you know? My dad passed away when I was very young, so it was just my mom, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was also the 60s, it was rock and roll, when rock and roll ruled the world, you know, and everybody was doing LSD, smoking weed, you know, masculine, anything that new came along, psychedelic drugs. And then the heroin, you know, got into play, and and then it was like, the jig is up. You know? All right, so you got it. So you're 14 years old. You decide, you fake that you're going to school. Your brother's doing really well, which I feel like happens a lot. The first kid usually plays the straight card, and then the second kid, I'm the second kid, and I'm like the clown and the funny one. And the yeah, he was, you know, he was great. He still is great, he, you know. But it was just one of those things where I just didn't do well in school. I just didn't, I couldn't. I probably had ADD. They just didn't have a diagnosis back then for it, you know? Mm -hmm. I just couldn't sit there. And, and once I found drugs, once I found heroin, it was like I found, oh, my God, you know, here's my new life. Here's who I want to be. I want to be a decadent dope fiend. You know, Keith Richards is shooting dope. He's playing, writing the best music in the world. So why can't I do that, you know? And Jim Morrison and Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin. And, you know, as most of those names, they're all dead now. I'm lucky right. I'm still alive, but. And I was like, why can't I do that shit too, you know? So I did that. Then I decided to steal one of my mother's checks, you know, from that she got from the VA, forged it, cashed it, bought a bus ticket to San Francisco, but only made it to Chicago because I ran out of money. I had no more money for food. I spent all the money every stop, every time this bus would stop on the way in the day and a half to get to Chicago back then, you know, I'd spend money on food. And by the time I got to Chicago, I was broke. Did your like, money go to drugs during this time, too, or just food when you were going to food, Chicago? Food, going to Chicago. When I was running away from home. And you were how old at this point? Fifteen. So I want to know, because I want to know about the heroin. All right, so you did drugs, mescaline, whatever, before, but then you picked up the heroin, because they always say that you do the heroin once, and you never get that high again. You're always chasing it. 
that you're chasing you you get that definitely get that high again you do get high again and you always chase it for the ultimate high you know which is the one when you hear about yo so and so od'd on 147th street the first word out of your mouth like where'd he come from who did he get it from i want some of that shit because you want it right it's the, it's the game to like teeter on the balance of like getting um, high but not dying. Exactly. As close, to, you walk that line as close as possible. You want the ultimate rush. When you hit it, you are like almost dead. And then you, you nod and you come right out of it. And you're like, wow. And then when you come out of it, you want it right away? Well, with heroin, no. Heroin would last, you know, four or five hours, six hours. You smoke a pack of cigarettes in a couple of hours. You nod and smoke and nod and smoke and burning your fingers, burning everything else around you. I see people nodding on the subway. They never fall, though. They never fall. So what is that? They're good at it. I was good in the subway, too. I could nod on the subway all the way to two minutes before my stop and just jump right up and get right off. Really? And some of them nod almost to the head is hitting the floor and they catch themselves. Is yeah. it almost like when you almost fall asleep, right, too? Right. Is that same feeling? They're sucking their own dicks. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what it's called? So, yeah. Oh Motherfucker, you say the motherfucker suck his dick. You know? That's how high he was. That's how high he is. Well, that's, isn't that every guy's ultimate dream to be able to suck his own dick on? I, you know, I've never <laughs> had that ultimate dream. And I, I, have, I would rather have other be beautiful women. Else. I don't need, you know, know I'm that, lucky but, like that. You know? That wasn't very nice to women. We, we, we do I love women, so, you know, it's, yes, you all of them. Women. We know that. Okay. But, all right, so you're in Chicago, you have no money, so what do you, so from there? I call home. Team God bless the mothers. Don't God bless the mothers. My mother, may she rest in peace, was the best. Immediately, she called one of her brothers. Immediately, got me, a, I think, the first ever prepaid plane ticket. You know, my uncle was able to prepay a ticket. He was always involved with the airlines, you know, in his own little way on TWA. From, wow, he used to think that was called Twins right, World Airlines, whatever. <laughs> from, and next thing I know, I'm at the airport and I'm on my way back to New York. And I'm on a plane. I've never been on a plane before. So now it's even fancy. Now you right. can treat even better. It's so funny. No so. security, no ID, nothing. Just, oh, your name is Eric Weinstein? Okay, we have a ticket here for you. Okay, follow me. Here, put them on the plane. See you later. Get off the plane. They're all waiting there. I'm like, oh, fuck. You see them pulling up. I'm at the gate. I'm looking at the window. And at those days, everyone was allowed to wait right at the gate for you. Yeah, right. You know, mm -hmm. they can pull right into the gate and there they're all there. I'm like, oh, I'm dead. They're going to kill me. 15 years old. They threw me in a program. They did? They immediately put me in a, took me to a hospital. They want to see how much, how addicted I was. And all I did was go in the hospital and made a kid that was on methanon. And he kept giving me methanon every night. So I was having fun at Gracie Square Hospital. It was the first time methanon ever started. And this kids had biscuits, orange biscuits. Biscuits. They were forty milligrams. He's like, "Yeah, have one." I was like, "Okay." How did he get in the hospital with them? Because they were, they were. No, they were giving them to him. Because right. he said he was a drug addict. They wanted to see how bad of a drug addict he was. You know, if they want to see if you're withdrawing, if you're going, through, they never saw anything with me because I kept taking the methadone. <laughs> Until one day they said, "Okay, well, now we're taking you to this other program." I was like, "Program." Right, how long were you in the hospital? Maybe five days. Five days, all right. Tonight. And then out of Gracie Square, next thing I know, I'm going to a place called Odyssey House. Mm -hmm. And they take me to it on 6th Street between, and I'm like, oh, I'm right across from the Fillmore East. This is great. I can jump right out the window, and I'm right here. The Fillmore East is well. Then they took me immediately up to what they call the first ever adolescent treatment unit in the called the Bronx ATU. All of a sudden, I'm at 955 Bruckner Boulevard in Odyssey House, and someone handed me a toothbrush telling me to scrub floors. I'm like, what? Wait a minute, what was the house you talked about? Was that a Odyssey music House. Place? Is that a music place? No, Odyssey House is a rehab, a drug rehab. Oh. One of the first drug rehabs in New York, live-in, residential drug treatment program. There was Daytop, Odyssey, and Samaritan, the first three major programs in New York City that dealt with drug addicts, you know? Okay, so then they sent you to They throw me in, in Odyssey House, and I, you know, I meet some friends, meet some people, I, I, Start doing okay. I get involved, and I stay there. You know, maybe nine months, eight, nine months. I'm clean. I'm doing well. They all of a sudden they send me to another a new facility, down on 87th Street, and they want me to start painting this facility. And I'm like, I don't paint. And they didn't want to hear that, so they took my cigarettes away. <laughs> I'm it's, not trying to laugh, but it's you funny, <laughs> right? They took my cigarettes away. So in the middle of the night, I told them they said you got to paint all night. 
I said, okay. I said, and they started making me paint the hallway. I left the paint and the brush and walked right out the fucking door and walked from 87th Street to 234th Street in the Bronx. Now, wait a minute. Let me ask you. Did you feel like, because when you just said that to me, I kind of felt like they were taking advantage of you making you paint the place. Well, that's what they, that was what they called therapy. Mm. But I don't know. When you give somebody therapy, like, I don't care. Even if it's you're occupational therapy. therapy. It's to keep your mind or on other things and to be, this is, make that, make them, you feel like this is your house. This is your place. You're going to live here, so you got to make it look good. Yeah, but part of me feels like they were using you guys. Well, they used everybody. That was it. Men, women, everyone, you had to do things. You had to work. You had to work till you slept. And groups, work, group, work, eat, work, groups. That was it. And did it help you? All right, so what, what I stayed clean for a while. So after I left that 87th Street, they threw me, I'm still 15 and a half, so they throw me back in the program. They make me go. They shave my head. They put a sign around my neck. They make me clean the, the oven with a toothbrush every night after everyone goes to bed for two hours. And they take my cigarettes for two But they put me back in the Bronx house where I was very happy. And then all of a sudden, four months later, they go, okay, well, we got a new facility on 18th Street. We want you to go down. I'm like, yeah, I'll go down. And they want you to paint. I'm like, oh, no, here we go again. Why didn't you like to paint? I just still don't like to. I don't know. You, don't, you just have a thing about, about painting. painting walls and shit. <laughs> just about fucking get, I get more paint on me than on the walls. But what did the sign say that they put around your neck, too? Oh, I'm, I was defiant. That I'm like, I'm a defiant person, confront me, get me in group, or something like that, you know? No. So they do the same thing in 18th Street. A day later, I jump out the window. And I walk from 18th Street <laughs> to 234th Street. And I was like, I'm not going back. Yeah. I am not going back. That was it. I convinced my mother to agree to let me do outpatient. Three times a week, I had to go to give up urine. She had to pay $2 each time for my urine results. And one day, they came back with a urine result that said I had Darvacet. I never took pills in my life. So someone took my urine and switched to their urine. And then she never believed me. You might have done why, because usually when you're a drug addict, the chances of people believing you, even if you it's are. Slim and none. Yeah. So that was that. And then, you know, I always said to myself, I was going to get high one more time then anyway. And unfortunately, that one more time lasted another, you know, 12 years, 13 years, you know. But here's the thing. As you're telling me this story, okay, and of course your mother doesn't know. She's just doing what they tell her. Oh, she knew by now. But it sounds like they were humiliating you instead of helping you, actually, as a Well, you know what? Back then, they they wanted to break you down. Their whole thing was break you down and build you back up. By break you down and have their different levels of the program, level one, two, three, and four. By the time you got to level four, you were running the program. They had people, residents, ran the program. They weren't staffed by... People that were paid, they were staffed by people that went through the program. Now, did the same thing happen there? You know that story about the jail people when they told the people in jail the people with the blue eyes were in charge and the people with the brown eyes were I've never heard that one. <laughs> well, it turns out the people, once they gave them the power, they were like turned into crazy maniacs. That's, like, yeah, they, they, they do. They, they go crazy in the, in the name of therapeutics or whatever they do. Yeah. But I, I you know, just, I, I wasn't committed back then. Mm hmm. I was not committed. I was more committed to being involved in, you know, getting high. And then, of course, 17 years old, I, I found a job. I'm clean for a while. I get a job. I got a good job working in a clothing store called Granny Takes a Trip. Granny Takes a Trip? It was a clothing store on 61st Street between 1st and 2nd where they sold English clothing where all the rock stars bought their clothing. Like one day, Keith Richards walked in with Bobby Keys and handed me tickets for the Stones concert in 1972 to the garden. And I'm like, oh, blah, 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 blah. And there's my idol walking in, putting, you know, bags of heroin and cocaine on the counter for everybody to sniff. And I was good. I was good. I just, just sniffed a little coke here and there was back then. Was that the first time when he came in that you had, after you'd been clean? No. Did, I, okay. No, I've, I was just doing coke back then. But you associated this rock and roll coolness. Of course you did, because Keith Richards defies all humanity with his drug addiction and everything. That right. Exactly. Like. The ultimate dope fiend. Right. You know, the, de <laughs> the ultimate decadent dope fiend, you know. Yeah. Keith Richards. True. And he's badass. Right. It's cool. Right. Cool. Everyone loves him. Getting more women, getting more of this, more of that. Plenty of money. So we actually came in the store like you yeah. Oh, my God. And your dream came true. And you right. Were like, oh, my God. Okay. Yeah. We all kind of like the stones were coming in. They bought all their clothes there. We made all the men's high heel shoes back then. Mm -hmm. His snakeskin shoes. All those velvet jackets. The two-tone velvet jackets. All the stuff he wore. All, I mean, so many people wore clothing. From Granny Takes a Trip, Rick Derringer, Ted Nugent, 
I mean, the McCoys, Vanilla Fudge, Leslie West, Mountain. Everybody wore clothes from Granny because you were cool. And it was expensive back then. A pair of boots was $125. Right. That's, that's a lot of money back in the 70s, you know? Probably like a thousand now, no? Oh, if you can't even find them. Yeah. And they were all made by these English cobblers that don't even exist anymore, you know? Right. And we had to measure people's feet and whatever they wanted. They could have all different shades of blue, red, patchwork leather or snakeskin or two-tone, whatever they wanted. So they kind of invented their own clothes and told you guys, and then you guys would make it so they had, like, an authenticity to right, it. That's right. cool. And it was a great job. It was I, the most fun of my life. Oh, yeah. You know, hanging out with all these rock and roll people, cool people, lots of women coming in, and all the groupies coming in. And get, we also sold women's, like, unique dresses. And back then it was, like, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Yeah. Really exist. No AIDS. No. no hepatitis C. No one gave a fuck. So it was totally free. Condom business was not doing good at all. <laughs> you know, lifestyles or fucking Trojans were like a thing of the past, you know? Right. And so you got a lot because you were working there. Right, were exactly. You were UA. Exactly. And then I met Alice Cooper, okay. and I started, you know, hanging out with him. And they all they wanted was lots of coke. Mm -hmm. So I found I had a great coke connection. I started bringing them all kinds of cocaine to their beautiful mansion in Greenwich, Connecticut, you know? Yeah. They've all since cleaned up. Now they're all pretty good, you know? Mm -hmm. And then it's, you know, I'm, I'm a roadie. The roadie crew, I see the road crew, they're loading the truck. I say, you guys need any help? <laughs> Not no, I'm just trying to be a nice guy. And I start rolling, you know, the, the, all the amps down the truck, doing this. And next thing you know, one of the guys said, well, can you hang out here tomorrow? And we have all to go to the city and do something, just watch the boys while they're doing their rehearsal. I'm going, rehearsal? I'm staying. <laughs> I'm here. I don't Clean clothes, who gives a fuck, you know? Yeah. So I started doing that, feeding, make sure Alice had his Budweiser's and... Make sure all the amps were turned on at night when they would finish rehearsing. All I did was sit there and listen to them rehearse every single day. And then once in a while I would drive Alice home, you know, and that to me was like, you know, him. And, I, and then Alice said, come on, let's go to Max's. I'm going to hang out with him at Max's Kansas City, meet more people, hang out with Todd Rundgren, Rick Derringer, this one, that one. And next thing you know, I'm, I'm feeling like the life of a rock star. So by accident, you become a roadie, and but you actually love the music, so they must have picked up on that too. Right, exactly. And I knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I played bass guitar. I knew about the instruments. I knew all about. Them. I was a, I was a guitar junkie, like I was a heroin junkie. You know, mm -hmm. I loved musical instruments. I still do. You know. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, I'm on the road. Next thing you know, that happens. You know, it's Alice. It's often you know, and here I meet the guys from Kiss. You know, so all of a sudden I'm working for Kiss. I'm doing their drum riser in the air. I'm making all the pyro and I'm, you know, hanging out with, with, with all these guys. They're meanwhile just starting out and they're opening up for Blue Eyes the Cold and we're doing a Canadian tour where they're opening up for Savoy Brown and Manfred Men and they're, they're nothing yet, you know? Mm -hmm. But how did you know to go with them? Like what made you leave? No, I met a, there was a kid in the neighborhood mm -hmm. that they called Moose mm -hmm. and I met him at a store, at a record store. He was hanging out. We just started talking. And he said, I said, what do you do? He goes, oh, I work for KISS. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to get my way in there. I want to work for KISS because I think they're going to be a big band. I mean, I lied, just like I lied to get into Alice because I know this. Oh, yeah, I drive this. I drive that, of course. I was going to say, you had a bullshit. How much did I drive? I didn't have a driver's license. First day, <laughs> I got up there, they, gave me, they, me, they throw me the keys to the truck. Hey, go down to Manny's, pick up Neil's drum kit, his new mirrored drum kit. You know how to drive a shift? Uh, of course I do. By the time I got down the hill, I realized I didn't take it. The emergency brake was still on. I was like, what the fuck is that smell? I burned out the emergency brake, and they're like, what happened to you? But I made it all the way down from Greenwich, Connecticut to New York, picked the drums up, and drove back, and didn't get to an accident. It was a miracle. And you figured it all out yourself. <laughs> I figured it all out. So sometimes school isn't what kids need. Sometimes figuring stuff out like that is even more profound. Experience is worth, is, is worth so much, you know? And like... Like balls that you don't know. It's either stupidity of balls you don't really know which is which, but you go with the balls thing. You just go yeah. and just do it. You want because yeah. you want it so bad. You want to be involved. You don't want to say I can't do that. And they go, well, we can't hire you then. Right. And they 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 you know they're throwing me fifty dollars here, hundred bucks here, and I'm like, wow, I got money in my pocket. Hanging out with Alice Cooper, going to Max's, driving a truck, being at these rehearsals. How old I'm, are you at this point? I'm seventeen. Oh my god. And I'm like. And they called my mother up saying, okay, he's here with us. And you know, like, she, and she said, yeah, sure, no problem. Because it was better than what you were doing. Because I was still straight. Still, oh, you were still I was still, wasn't doing any, I wasn't shooting any heroin anymore. Okay, so the I stopped was the, that was, was the I would stop, the heroin was, you know, for that time, for the time being, right then, I had stopped, but then. Unfortunately, I found it again later. I didn't want to hear about it anymore. But yeah. that's amazing that 
the esteem that you were getting from actually, which is funny because that's what they were trying to do in the rehab. They were trying to give you work that made you feel good, but they were doing it in a shamed way. And I believe that if you treat human beings, even just because you're a drug addict doesn't mean you're not a human being. Absolutely. They weren't treating you with respect and you were smart enough to know that that's why you kept leaving. But, but adults will think, oh, they're just defiant. They're not defiant. And, adult, and, you, and someone that's 25 or 28 or 30, when a 17-year-old's around, they kind of take them under their wing. Mm -hmm. They're kind of like, for little brother, let me help this kid out, you know. And they were all good to me. Alice is good to me. And, you know, Michael and Dennis and Glenn, they were all really cool, you know. I helped them out. I did this, and I got them the drugs. And, mm -hmm. you know, I would I would show for their groupies in and out sometimes, you know. And But it was still better than doing the heroin. Right, exactly. All right, so you're 17, you're with Kiss. And then the Kiss tour comes to an end. I didn't get along with the ro other roadies. I wasn't like one of these kind of guys that wants to drink beer and... I was like, fuck that. I wanted to hang out with the girls, you know, and have lots of sex and mm -hmm. let them fuck around with me and play around, and, and that's what I did. And this ups your, like, sexual attraction factor, like... Yeah, even kisses when, when you know, if they couldn't get to the band, the road crew was right there, yeah. you know? <laughs> the road crew was right there, with the, you know, with the backstage passes, you know? Yeah. okay. Right, so we were right there, and you're, you're all of a sudden, you're this... You're just as attractive as, as the guys in the band because you can get them a backstage pass. Mm -hmm. Or you could tell them where the band's staying. And maybe if you go to the band and tell them, hey, this girl was really good, you know, Paul or Jean or Ace will go, oh, let me see her. What's her name? Let me look at her. I'll tell her to come to my room. Wow. That's what it was like. Just they, just, they didn't care, right? They didn't care. And then from Kiss, I went to work to, for a great band called Blue Oyster Cult, mm -hmm. which to, the, to this day I still have a gold record. I remember their record, Agents of Fortune, which featured their big hit single, Don't Fear the Reaper. And who I loved, who I stayed with them for four or five years, but there the drugs escalated again. Because one of the guys, I don't mention his, in the band, okay. was really into heroin. Mm -hmm. And I kept copying him, and I would go to baseball games and do in the day, and then go to do heroin at night and hang out and get crazy and just do lots and lots of, lots and lots of drugs, speedballing. And it got really crazy back then, up until the point where uh, I stayed with them for a while. Then, then when they go off the road, their manager, great person, great guy, Sandy Perlman, would send me out with his other bands. He had the Dictators, who were a big punk rock band, and Handsome Dick Manitoba, and I would just like do more heroin than could be imagined. Did, did the manager know that you were doing all the heroin? He had an idea, but he didn't, he didn't want to believe it, I think, you know? Right. And then he sent me with a French band called Shaking Street. And, it, and then all of a sudden, in 1979, and I'm in Paris... Living in Paris for a year. All right, so you go from being in rehab with a sign around your neck. To, to four years later, to five, no, more than that, more than that, many years later, to being in, living in Paris in Pigalle at the Terrasse Hotel overlooking where Beethoven's buried. <laughs> and, you know, couldn't get too much heroin there, so I got this really crazy habit because you could buy pure codeine over the counter at a drugstore. So I was, and for 80 cents, I was getting 65 milligram codeine pills. I started taking... Like 60 a day. Oh, my God. Right. So I'm doing all these pills, and I'm feeling okay. No drug, because the heroin I was doing back there when I was in New York, methanol, I couldn't get it, so I didn't want to lose the job. So I figured it out, you know. So here I am with Shaking Street, doing everything with them, 79, 80, 24, 25 years old, you know, mm -hmm. 26. And then... So it wasn't affecting your body or your health or anything? No, I was really lucky. Okay, good. I didn't share needles. I had terrible veins. So I couldn't share Nita, so I always, wanted, I always bought new works, mm -hmm. as I called them, when I was getting high, you know. And then, you know, September 20th, 1981, my mom passed, mm -hmm. and that was it. There wasn't enough heroin in the world to kill the pain. I tried. I went through every penny I had, everything, overdosed five times, busted my face open, did as much heroin as I possibly can get my hands on. Were you still working with the band? No. They realized that I was a drug addict by that time, and they were like, no, you got to no. go. And my mom died and left me a bunch of money. Oh, no. So, of course, all the money went to my arm. Got evicted from my apartment. I was on a methadone program at the same time. And I said, look, I need some help or I'm gonna, it's going to be over. What made you say that? That's what I want to know. Because I had no place to live. I was desperate. I was smelling like a water buffalo. I, I was working. My uncle gave me a job working in the garment center in his, his coat factory. And I was doing all that, but I was just... I was just surviving. I was just, but you didn't want to die. There was some, I, I didn't want to die. That's amazing. I, wanted, I, didn't, I, want, I had the will to live. And I went and I overdosed one more time 
at this shooting gallery in Harlem on 127th Street. And the guys left me. They, they gave me a shot of milk. They said they give you a milk shot. They thought it, it start your heart up. Mm -hmm. They said I was turning purple. They were, and the guy came back around and just looked at me. And he said he never saw it. But all of a sudden, the will to live, my face just all of a sudden started turning white again, turning normal colors. And I just came out of it. That you wanted to be alive. Uh, my will to live was so powerful that I didn't even know it was so powerful. But I really think that that happened, that yeah. happened with my brother. Like, yeah, and the next day I walked into a program. May 3rd, 1984, I walked into a program, and I haven't looked back since. So 1984, clean since 1984. You come out of the program, and then... I go back to work in the garment center for mm -hmm. a little while, and then I go back to work at the program. Oh. I decided, you know... I was really good. I really loved doing therapy. I loved running groups. I loved helping other people that were in my situation. And they loved me. So I go in there as a counselor for $19,000 a year, no money. Mm -hmm. You know, struggling financially stuff, but I stay there. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I become assistant, uh, another, uh, like an assistant director. Then I, eventually I became the director of the program. Oh, wow. So I walked into that program homeless. And when I left, I walked out the director. See, no. every story you tell, like you start off and then all of a sudden you push your way through, you become very successful. You push right. your way through, you become very successful. That's, right. Yeah, that's right. a testament to you. So I, I become the director, and one day I get a phone call. Could I teach this kid, Jimmy Matteo, if you, anything about heroin so he can act like a heroin addict? They want him for this movie called Basketball Diaries. Now, of course, I know because of Blue Eyes the Cult, I knew Jim Carroll really, really well. Jimmy used to hang out with Patty, and Patty used to go out with Alan. So I was part of that whole circle. I knew the book really well. I said, look, send them to me. Okay. He, they sent them to me on a Wednesday. He gets the part Thursday. Thursday night, I get a phone call. Can I come Friday morning at 7 in the morning to meet with Leonardo DiCaprio to teach him everything about drugs? <laughs> now, I tell said, me what's going on inside of you. I'm like, well, first of all, Leo was nothing back then. Okay. And I'm thinking, what's going inside of me is like, I'm thinking like, that, hey, mom, all I'm thinking about is money. Right. How, movie. You think film. That they got millions and millions and millions of dollars, right. and they're just going to throw it at you. Right. Bullshit. Right. <laughs> right. But still, I did. You know, I got there and I met with Leo and Scott Calvert, who's the director. And when I'm there, he gets a phone call. Hey, by the way, you just got nominated for an Academy Award for What's Eating Gilbert Grape. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, congratulations. I had seen Leo in This Boy's Life mm -hmm. with De Niro, and I loved the movie before that. Oh, me too. I love that movie. Yeah, yeah. And I started telling Leo all these things about drugs, and, and they were like, we want to hire you on the spot. So I cut a deal where, like, I got paid $5,000 for the first 40 hours I worked, and then they would they would really commute, compute how many times they needed me and whatever they needed me to do. And then they said to me, all right, so I, I, I work with Leo for three months, a couple hours a day here, a couple hours here. I take him all around New York City. On Saturday mornings, I get a van. I take him to where all they're selling all the methanol. And he just trusts you, right? <coughs> right away. And, and he just knows... And I take him, I say, oh, get out of the car. Just stand over there and see if anyone approaches you. Because nobody knew who he was at this point. No so one knew. Okay. He's out the car with a cigarette, head banging, you know, dangling, you know. And, and within five minutes, people, yo, what do you want? Yo, you want some methanol? Yo, you want some Valiums? And he was like, he played the part of the now I'm cool, I'm straight, you know, whatever. Yeah. And, the, and they saw, yo, you selling? People started coming up to him, asking if he was selling drugs. He was really got into the character. And then he jumped back in the van. I started taking him around. I showed him the rehabs. I showed him all over New York. Took him down to raise pizza. Took him all over. And he was great. I told him about cocaine. And then we went through this whole thing about the withdrawal scene. About, you know, how when you masturbate, it makes you feel better. Because it releases the same endorphins when you have an orgasm as it does when you shoot heroin. Mm -hmm. And he, he was just like, okay, you believed everything. Everything. Like, you could have been lying to him, right? I, well, I wasn't, though. But I was, right. right. And he did this amazing thing. And I was on set with him every time he did it. It was like two takes. For the withdrawal scene he did. I worked with him. I worked with, with uh, the guy. Everyone that was, all of a sudden, I was a technical consultant. Eric E. Factor <laughs> Weinstein was a technical consultant for Basketball Diaries doing all the drug stuff. Was it Ma all that? Did you get the credit? You yeah, the, of course. Credit? Yeah. Of course I got the credit. And Leo said to me, show me your tough guy. I didn't realize he wanted me to play a part that eventually Michael Rappaport did, and I didn't do it. Oh. I don't know, I'm not, I should have done it. You know, whatever. So then I meet Juliet Lewis, Ernie Hudson, Bruno Kirby, who passed away, may he rest in peace. Mm -hmm. uh, and they say, would I mind working with Mark Wahlberg? And I'm thinking, Mark Wahlberg, Marky Mark, that kid, like, 
I'm like, you know what? It's money. Fuck it. I'll do it. You know? Right. Oh, because Marky Mark, to you, with the whole music history, you were like... Mm. Yeah, I wasn't into rap. <laughs> I wasn't into the underwear hanging out. I wasn't into any of that stuff. You know, it wasn't my scene, yeah. you know? Yeah. But something happened from the first day we met. He, and I'm drug-free now, clean as a whistle. And he comes in, pulls out a blunt, you know, rolls one, just like sits by the window and has a, takes a couple of hits. And I'm like... This guy's got balls. Mm -hmm. He's got ovaries. Not ovaries. He's got, he got what it takes. Yeah. And he said to me one day, he said to me, you think I'm going to be, a, a, you know, I should be a rapper or I should be an actor? I said, I thought one day not only are you going to be just a rapper or an actor, whatever, you're an actor, I said, you're going to be one of the best actors on the planet. Okay, now tell me how you knew that, honestly. I didn't. Just from his performance in Basketball Diaries. And this is before, right after we finished Basketball Diaries, I went to L.A. with him. He invited me to L.A. And it was just something about this kid that was he's so charming. real. He's, and he's very and he's so real. It was, he's not, he's charming, not, he's charming with other people, with his friends, he's real. Right. You know that, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So. Well, and I he, find real charming. Maybe that's right. what I mean. Yeah. 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 Right. And I said to him, you know what? And he goes, you, I got no money. You want to come for the trip? And at the same time, I was still working for the program. They were looking, they wanted me to get a, go for a PhD. And I'm like, well, it's going to cost me $175,000 to get it. There's no tuition reimbursement. And they said to me, well, you can earn $74,000 a year once you get it. And I was like, I'm out of here. That's crazy. And it just didn't work too good. And it was time for me to move on. And here I am 20 years later, 34 movies later, TV show. And life is good and still clean. And still clean, and you've, but clean you've been with Mark Kelly. Are there any stories that you're allowed to tell us about what happened? I mean, there's, there's, there's some cool I mean, funny stories, stories, like chicks and stuff. Anything? Back I mean, Mark. You know, Mark. When he was young, when he, when he when I first met him, he was a magnet for the women. They all loved him. They all found him charming, and beautiful. Everyone loved his Calvin Klein ads. You know, he was very popular in Europe, very popular in Germany, very popular because of his music, you know, mm -hmm. and because of his work. And I think Mark, the whole thing about Mark, he always just wanted to change the persona and make people respect him as an actor, which he has got to this day now, you know? Yes. I mean, funny stories, we, you know, we traveled around the world together, everywhere you can imagine. You know, him and I went to Afghanistan together with the troops, with Fighter, mm -hmm. you know, the movie you're in that we all did. And, yeah. and Mark and I went to Afghanistan without any press or anything, just to show the Marines the movie. We went there on two days before Christmas a couple of years ago and showed 25,000 Marines the movie, and he signed 25,000 autographs and took 25,000 pictures at least, he did. if not one. And he's just a, a good guy. He's, you know, he doesn't say no to people. He likes to live his life as real and as normal as he can be. Mm -hmm. He knows he has to sell it. He doesn't, he doesn't play the Hollywood game. He doesn't play that car. He doesn't act like that. You know, he's still a real guy, you know? Well, he has a lot of people trying to get stuff from him, too, which is Yeah, crazy. yeah. I mean, it's fun on the golf course. He's funny. He's he a funny guy balls. on the he golf course. He, he does amazing him. imitations of everybody. He does. You know, he, you want to meet? <clears throat> you know what? I'm sure he can if I ask him, you know? <laughs> I'm sure he'll do a good one. <clears throat> he'll do some Southie shit, you know? <laughs> you know, him and Bo, you know, and all the other guys from, from Boston, you know? Yeah. And, uh... I mean, it's just been a ride. It's been a great ride. It's been a great journey, trip. You know, I'm 58. I got maybe another 10 years, maybe, who knows, left. Doing so how this. did you start working with him? So you went for the free trip. So we went for the trip, and then Mark just said to me, do I want to come for the ride? Meaning the no, whole ride. Let's go. Do you want to do this movie? He had a movie offer to do Fear. Yeah, people loved him in that. Yeah, so I said, okay. And next thing I know, I'm in fucking Vancouver. <clears throat> where it's raining every single day with James Foley, great, who I love as director, you know, and doing, he had Ross to fill with him, and this other guy, Carlos. You know, oh, yeah, who's Ross to fill? I always see him in the pictures. Ross to fill is uh, one of Mark's childhood friends from Boston. Mm -hmm. He uh, had a place called The Firehouse. Everyone used to hang out mm -hmm. in Dorchester. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's a music guy, always wanted to be a reggae artist, wanted to be a music artist, and Mark would try to help Help him out, help him out like he helps out all of his friends, you know. And Rasta Philip couldn't be in America because he got deported. Right. Or whatever. And uh, so he would come work with us whenever we worked out of the country. Mm -hmm. So Rasta Phil is there, and it's myself and this other guy, Carlos, this big guy, 
who's like a narcoleptic, falls asleep in the car at the traffic light. You know, come on, Mark. Mark, I got to go home, Mark. Mark, I, I got to get some baked ziti, Mark. My mom's going to cook for me. And next thing he's talking, like, <laughs> falling asleep, and over, smacking the back of his head. Wake the fuck up. At a traffic light. <coughs> he falls asleep. And who was this guy? How did he get there? He, he got there because he was, he used to drive for a company called Music Express. Yeah. He drove for Music Express, and Mark and them liked him, so he started driving for Mark on his own. Mm -hmm. Like, Mark would get him to steal the car, right. and just like, not steal, but take right. it and drive me, but don't tell him you're driving me, you know, and I'll right. pay you on the side, you know? Yeah. And he, and then he, all of a sudden, Mark hired him to work in basketball diaries for him. And he was his driver, and all he would do is sleep in the car. He hired some funny people. What about Nacho? Nacho's... Nacho's still funny. It's still... Nacho's Nacho. We were... Nacho is a big... Let's... Nacho is a big guy from Boston. Who eats, fucking drinks five bottles of Tabasco sauce. <laughs> on le... on Jimmy Kimmel, he had four golf balls of, of uh, wasabi, and then, and then chased it with three 16-ounce glasses of Tabasco sauce. He did it for on real. Jimmy because on Jimmy it originally Kimmel. started with Joe Pesci, right? Playing right. golf. What did you do? On the Joe Pesci one, Mark hits a, gets a, we're playing golf at a, a Joe's charity. He hits a ball and it's a divot. He takes a divot, puts it in his thing. We get back. He goes, Nacho, eat the divot. And Nacho goes, oh, cash is king. Put the cash up and I'm going to eat it. If you give him money. You give him money and I'm fucking eating anything you want. <laughs> All of a sudden, Pesci throws up a hundred. I throw a hundred. This one throws. There's a pot of $750. Put it on a burger. Let's go. Puts it on a burger. Adds some ketchup and mustard and eats the fucking divot burger. And he got the seven hundred. And got the seven hundred fifty dollars. Cash is king. Cash is king. But Nacho, up. the fucking grass has got so much shit in it. It's okay. Cash is king. He didn't get so then Mark hired him. He did all the security on the fighter. So his job security was just watch the trailer. Right, he had to watch the trailers. But meanwhile, he's trying to go out with me. Trying to go out with you and every other sister, anyone that'll listen to him, and anyone that'll that'll look at him sideways, and I hey, give it a big smile, come over, try to give you a hug and a kiss. I said, Nacho, stop kissing the girls, stop kissing them. I'm gonna fire your fucking ass. And what does he say? Because he really. Not I'm only, not doing it, Eric. What are you talking about? Not only did he do that on the set, he bothered me in New York. Remember, I called yeah, you. I, 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 was, I had to call in and <laughs> yell at him. You know, leave Sue Costello alone. She's not interested. <laughs> She's not interested, you fucking idiot. <laughs> I love you, Nacho, but sometimes you're a fucking idiot. Oh, my God, he kept calling me, kept calling. And then when we went to the other guys, this is where Mark's funny. So we go to the other guys' premiere. I'm still, I have to go to the bathroom, so I run up to go to the bathroom. It is packed. Fans everywhere. Mark's in his suit. He comes walking down. It's crazy, crazy, crazy. He comes up. He gives me a hug. He whispers in my ear, your boyfriend's here. <laughs> I remember that. I said, Mark, you go away from me. And he's laughing. And then we oh, because he knew the whole thing that happened. Yeah, yeah. I told him, Mark, we're having a problem with Nacho and Sue Costello. <laughs> what the fuck's the problem? <laughs> what could be the problem, you know? He couldn't imagine. Well, she's in her trailer, and he's outside our trailer, and he's walking over to her trailer, and he's giving her the fucking, you know, the business, you know? Yeah, he wouldn't, and then he called me for forever. And then, but Mark, when we were leaving that premiere, he was in his uh, Escalade. And we were in my car, and we happened to be beside each other. And he I remember, out rolled the window, down the window. Right? Right. He was yelling, and he's like, Sue, Nacho's in the back. And my friend was like, Sue, that was like watching two kids from the neighborhood just hanging up. Exactly. It was funny. Like, Nacho's in the back. Well, we did grow up to, my father used to coach him playing basketball. Right. right. And his mom used to take care of my mother in the nursing home. Oh, wow. Yeah, up in Granby away. She was the kindest to my grandma. My grandma had like Alzheimer's. And Alma used to take care of her. Really? Yeah, and then uh, Tracy, I used to hang around with the sister Tracy all the time at Dance Factory. Now Alma's working at Alma Nova, the restaurant. Oh yeah, doing really well. She's the, uh, she's the, yeah, she's the uh, host. And the Wahlburgers. And Wahlburgers is doing very well, it's in, uh, right across the street from Alma Nova. But people don't understand that entourage is really true. Like they really give. Like when you're that famous and you're that cool, people give you stuff like they did. I mean, I remember being down at Life. Remember the club downtown? Uh, I, I was Life, sitting beside yeah. Mark. I forget what. Point of his career, he was I in. remember you were there. I tried it. We used to go there all the time. And the girls were climbing over my head, literally. I think he was smoking at the time or something. Because I remember he was looking straight forward, and the girls were climbing over me. And I was like, Mark, I was like, these girls are like climbing all over my head. I'm like, how do they know I'm not your girlfriend? And he goes, they don't care. <laughs> exactly. But he was just like. But that's what it was like, you know. I mean, that's what that those were those days, you know. And those were the days we, you know, he was young and 
there's too many people around. There are lots and lots of people around. And, and Entourage is kind of real. I mean, I'm the real E. There's a real Johnny drama. Mm -hmm. Turtle is based on this character named Donkey, who was a, kind of a jackass. You know, unfortunately, he passed away mm -hmm. because he, you know, wouldn't listen to the doctors. And oh, yeah, he had, uh, he had asthma, right? Yeah, he had asthma. He had an attack, went to the hospital. He said, they said, don't leave, don't leave. You know, famous expression from people, I'm all set. Yeah. I'm all set, walked out, goes to get into a hot bath at home, has another attack, won't let his girlfriend call the ambulance till they get, finally she left him, he left him call. They called and he expired right before he got outside, right before he got to the hospital. And his real name was Donkey, and how old was Donnie he? Donnie Carroll, and he was yeah, 39. That's sad. And yeah. Mark's still friends with, what's Baranowski, Kevin? Isn't that his name? Um, One of the guys from this, from Savinel, from our neighborhood, he's still friends. I sat beside him at the premiere. He's just still like a regular guy. He's Kevin, he's Mark's friend. Kevin? And, and Mark, remember at the premiere in, in Boston, he looked up and he's like, Sue Costello's here. You did a good job. I was like, thanks, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. It's funny to see how where everybody's come from. But for you to fit into that picture, it's crazy that you just got in there. And well, it's really crazy. First of all, I'm a Yankee fan. Yeah. And it's hard for a Yankee fan, a New York fan, to be involved with a Red Sox fan right. and figure it out and be able to argue and fight about it and still walk away and you know and after the Red Sox won he was I never heard the end of it you know yeah. we were up three nothing the Red Sox came back and won four and and the most important thing was that they went through New York to win the World Series mm -hmm. World Series didn't mean shit right. what it meant was them getting there and beating the Yankees mm -hmm. so I never heard the end of it you right. know yeah. And but you know, at least I'm not I'm not really a Jet fan or a Giant fan because then to me they're not in New York, they're in Jersey. All right. You know, and he loves it. he's a big Patriots yes. fan. Him and Tom Brady, you know, he yells at Tom when he doesn't win, you know. Mm -hmm. He gets really mad at them, you know. Mm -hmm. So Which is cool because he still remembers where he comes from. Right. And his mom, like he's totally still like Alan's right. always there. Right. Alan was always there, exactly. And then his you know? brother Donnie. Donnie's doing good too. Donnie just I just saw Donnie. Donnie was, was shooting an episode of uh what's it called? Blue Bloods. Blue Bloods. I saw he was on my block on eighty second street. And Donnie told him to go back and do one more year with the new kids. He is. Imagine yeah. that. Isn't that crazy that it's, they read? The, and there's still so much in demand. That's what's crazy, you know? Mm -hmm. Really, really crazy. And I wonder if people really understand. Like we come from the inner city, Boston, like and Mark was the youngest guy to ever go to Deer Island, right? He says that a lot, yeah. right? Yeah. And then that's what kind of turned him around a little yeah. bit. And, then he, and Donnie helped him produce the Marky Mark in the Funky Well, Donnie, Mark, right? was, Donnie was the one who got him to deal with Jimmy Iovine. What about Marty Starr? Didn't he have something to do with Marcus really had, much to do with, had more to do with Donnie than he did with Mark. Mm -hmm. You know, Donnie was really much more to do with Mark and handling of his record career, his music career, and got him to Jimmy Iovine and Innistrope, got him a deal. You know, but Mark wasn't, you know, at the end... He was like, he didn't want to work that hard, running around, you know, on the road so much. And it was like, once he met Penny Marshall, and Penny Marshall offered him a renaissance man and tr said, try to be an actor and, you know, come and audition for this and do that. Once he got the acting bug, that was it. Yeah. He realized he had enough, he has enough substance in him that he can go out and do, play any part. And the, the thing that's been great is he's really chosen his parts well. Mm -hmm. Nothing for the money. Well, everything. was awesome. He was fucking Boogie Nights. Nice. Right, Paul Thomas Anderson, you know, great. He was amazing. He had to really let it hang out there, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he to did. say the least, you know. Yeah. And uh, I feel like he was very vulnerable in that one. That's was. what I loved about it, how vulnerable he was. Right. He let himself be so vulnerable, let himself, because, you know, wondering, you're at that age and that time in your life, and you're, what are the guys in the neighborhood going to say? Mm -hmm. what's, everyone, what's everyone in the neighborhood, what's everyone going to think of me when I do this, you know? He let it all go. And just put it all into his performance, which is great. And it's crazy that he changed himself from Marky Mark into being this respected and to be Mark I remember Walton. being in Quincy. I lived in Quincy. And I called. I put, put on MTV. And I called my dad. I said, Dad, Mark Wahlberg's on MTV. And he has huge muscles. And he's rapping. And my father's like, oh, yeah, that's what he's doing now. That's what he does now. And I was like, oh, my gosh. How did he do that? And Donnie, to his credit, really did help. Because wasn't Mark part of New Kids in the very beginning? He never was really part of They wanted him to be. He yeah. didn't want to. He was young. He was really young then. Yeah, he was really young, exactly. I mean, really young. Really I remember young. Donnie, so I worked at Savannah Variety, and Mark used to hang outside, and I bought him, and he says that I, that I didn't bought him, but I did, because he stole some candy. He says, I don't eat candy. He told David to wrestle that. Right, he doesn't eat. <laughs> Not right. anymore, because it probably doesn't, but when he was a kid, 
But Donnie, he used to walk up and down with those drumsticks every single day in this neighborhood where there was a lot of chaos, a lot of drugs, a lot of fighting. I mean, here were these kids. A lot of like, fighting. You had to fight your way out of the neighborhood, right? Yeah, and for them to have turned their lives into what they turned them into. That's what he family. did. That's what I look at Mark doing. You know, The Fighter was more than just a movie about a boxer. It was about a man, about a person getting their, their ass out of that neighborhood, getting and onto something better. And fighting to get through it, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, him and Mickey are still great friends, you know? Mickey is the kindest. Right. And we saw, uh, even saw Dickie. Yeah. You know, about a year ago, he was all right, you know? Mm -hmm. And the sisters were amazing. The whole movie was the whole, awesome. Yeah. Making that movie in 33 days was incredible. Yeah, people don't know that it only took 33 days. 33 days. And, and the budget was pretty low, you know? Yeah. To have Mark Christian, Amy Adams, David O. Russell. Mark saved David O. Russell's career. Yeah. Mark gave him a job and nobody wanted to hire and him. And to David's know. credit, he's a great director. I worked well with him. He's very like, do this, do that, you know. Yeah, he'll tell you what to do. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. He, that's, that's his, that is his greatness. He'll tell you exactly what he wants. Where directors, some directors will beat around the bush, won't tell you, don't do this, don't, you know, try something different. He'll tell you, do it this way. Well, I can tell you his brain from... The scene, the thing that everybody remembers, one of the funny things from the movie is when Christian jumps out the window the second time. Right, right. Well, the first, I was there on one of the first days, and he had me do a, do a take where I said, he did it again, he did it again. So David's brain knew that that joke was coming, and it ended up coming to fruition by him actually physically doing it. Right, twice. So this, right. The thing I did wasn't in it, but I was like, oh, that guy's brain was working. I think out. Christian and Amy are going to do another movie with David. Yeah? I think it's something coming up after, after this whole silver lining thing, you know? But that's so crazy, Art, that you started off as that kid and you decided that you were going to go get your GED and here you are. How many years have you been working with Mark? I'm with Mark 20 years now. Well, it'll be 20 years in February. 20 years and you've just 93, started. yeah, we started, we started, that's when I really started. This January, in December and January I met with, but they didn't start shooting uh, Basketball Diaries to February of 93, February, March, and I was cold. I remember it was fucking freezing. Where did they shoot it here, right? All in New York City. Yeah. Yeah. And have you had any fights, any breakups, any come? No, you've always been together all the whole time. Oh no! I, once I told him to kiss my ass, <laughs> and I left. I did the Great Escape, and we ended up getting back because I just couldn't handle his whole. You know, sometimes things get out of hand. It's yeah. not what you, and it's not what you want. Mm -hmm. So you put you take you take yourself out of it. You remove yourself from the situation. Mm -hmm. So I just removed myself from the situation, and he realized it that I wasn't one of these kind of kids that I'm. I basically what it is. I look at it as I am an employee. Mm -hmm. I am a worker. Mm -hmm. I can be replaced. Right. And as long as you keep that attitude, right, you're always going to do your job. Right. I'm not. I don't want to. I'm his friend, mm -hmm. and I'm, I love Mark to death, and I know he loves me to death as well. Mm -hmm. But still, first and foremost, he's my boss. Mm -hmm. I work for him. I want to make sure he gets everything done, and I have pride in what I do. Yes, which is why that happened, that happened when I from right. full circle to when you were sitting there with Alice Cooper and you were enjoying the music, you weren't just a roadie. Right. I have pride. I'm not doing anything. I don't want, If I'm going to do something, even when I was a cab driver, I was a good cab driver. You know? Right. Exactly. When I worked in the program, second job, you know, I need money, so I got a hack license, you know? But the value of that as a performer myself, like to have somebody that you can actually really trust that's not going to... Step out. They can be friendly enough, but that's going to respect that because you have so much pressure on yourself. I mean, I don't have the pressure that Mark does, but I have pressure too. Well, there's a lot of pressure now, especially with you know four kids, the wife, mm -hmm. nannies, travel, visiting. We're doing. We did four movies last year, you know, mm -hmm. and we're about to get ready to do Transformers Four and starting in April or May. Mm -hmm. You know, for six, it's going to be a six month shoot. Mm -hmm. you know, he shoots 120 shooting days. That's a lot of days. You yeah, know? to maintain, like, to hold on to yourself and actually put out the camera what you want to put out while dealing with all that stuff. People don't understand that. They don't, I mean, you have to, every time you walk into the hotel, every day you get a call sheet, every day you know, okay, 5.30 a.m., we've got to be out the door. You know, it's all got to be done on time. And all the people that want stuff from you. Like, they come to me to get stuff from Mark. I'm like, Carol, I, I had a woman from People magazine. I was telling this girl from the New York Times the other night, some, one of those magazines, maybe it wasn't people, it was In Touch or something. She called me and she's like, do you have any dirt on Mark? And I was like, that's, this is a lot. First of all, I wouldn't do that anyways to Mark. But second of all, I'm not a loser. I wouldn't build my career. You wouldn't do person. anything to anybody but dirt. <laughs> Who could tell you something like that? And to be honest with you, every time I see him, I remember we went to the Invincible. Is it the premiere? Invincible, yeah. And he had all these guys, these bodyguards around him. And all of a sudden he was like, 
pushed them aside and they, they opened up and I walked in the circle and they closed around me like, what's up, Sue? <laughs> there was something to growing up where we grew up that like, and he did tell me that. He told me that at life, I think. He said, I'm glad. I'm glad that you're in doing what I'm doing too. It's nice to have somebody well, else. Well, didn't we meet, what the, that was when he was going to do that movie, uh, not Southie. There was a movie that the kid from uh, Boon, 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 Boon Rock. Which Boon one? Dark Saints. Boondock Saints. Yes. Yeah. Wasn't he from Boston? Yeah. That's when you, we, we, do we meet you with him? No, I think I met you because that maybe Donnie was with, because I was doing selfie with exactly. Donnie. And that's how I went back and finally reconnected. Right. With Jimmy Cummings and all those guys, exactly. they were all. Exactly. Running, yeah. But it's been, you know, basically it's been a hell of a ride mm -hmm. and it's not over yet. No. Because what, you're being healthy now, right? What were you telling me? I'm, in, I'm clean 28 years. I was telling you, drink, oh, my juice. Yeah, you're drinking the green Organic juice. Organic Avenue, having my chlorophyll, my wheatgrass, my E, uh, whatever it's called, E juice. It's an E, whatever. It's an E, E3. Mm -hmm. And I had ginger, and I have all, it's called uh, green love. Every day. Every day. Well, you have to stay strong, because if you ever go do all these movies, you have to be a good employee. Exactly. <laughs> and, and enjoy my own life at the same yeah. time. You know, most important. <laughs> All right, before we go, before we end, I want to ask you this. I want you to tell me, and this is, this is the first thing that comes to your head. I want you to tell me a time in your life, one story, that when you were really, really scared, but you decided, besides the one when you almost died, because you did you did choose life, but the story when, when hope overcame fear, where you were like, oh my God, I'm scared, but I'm going to go for it. Well, you know what? There was a time when I was working for this rock and roll band called Black Oak, Arkansas. And we were living, I was living in Arkansas, and we were at this lake called Bull Shoals Lake. And everybody is running off this 50-foot cliff, diving into the lake, you know? And I was scared as a fucking, to, you kidding me? Jump off a 50-foot, and finally one second, just something just happened. I didn't even go to the end, I just ran. And not only did I not jump, I dove. Oh, wow. And for that one second... One, whatever it was, when I got out of that water, it's, it's, there was lots of hope. And there was realizing that, you know what, whatever fears you have, you can conquer them. And there were other fears in my life. I was always scared of getting straight, but that wasn't that one moment. Mm -hmm. You know, would I be able, and would I be successful? Mm -hmm. Sometimes people have fear just of success, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. I got over, there were so many fears, you know? I mean, I was always, I had a fear of getting bald, and I got bald, and now I'm over it, you know? <laughs> you still look good. Oh, I feel good, right. Now, exactly. what's the Twitter handle so people can follow you? E-Factor18. E-Factor, so it's at E-Factor18 on Twitter. Yeah, E-Factor18 on Twitter. Oh, thanks for the talking to me, Eric. The real E. The real E. I love it. He's the real E from Entourage, everybody. He's a real person. He's had this huge life. He's been Mark's right-hand man. He looks great. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to talk to him. I love it because everybody has a story and nobody has any idea what people, the way their lives go. Be around. One day there'll be a book. And the book is going to be called Even Guardian Angels Fuck Up. Even Guardian Angels Fuck Up. I don't better copyright that. I already did. I got <laughs> it. I own it. <laughs> I own it. Like Five it. times. <laughs> Even Guardian Angels Fuck Up. If you take my title, I'll kill you. <laughs> I, this Guardian Angel Fuck Up again. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.